I would like to thank the local organizers, Vitor, Caria, Mario, uh, the, all the team around Vitor. I don't know where Vitor you are there, so we should applaud them for the organization. <laughs> so now it's a, a great pleasure and honor to introduce John. Even if John needs no introduction, you all know him and, and his work. Uh, John's work is widely known and cited. I counted more than 30,000 Google sites. Uh, am I right? It's about the, well. Uh, John's impact uh, on the profession uh, is huge and covers a whole range of topics. Uh, most importantly, productivity, uh, innovation, labor markets, the economics of firms and, and innovation um, and organization. <clears throat> on the latter, John's work, uh, for example, on skill bias organiza organizational change is a pioneering attempt at uh, analyzing uh, uh, the determinants of firms' organizational, organizational design and their impact on firms' productivity. Uh, more recently, John's papers on management practices have provided a wealth of new data and brought the field of management into mainstream uh, economics. On innovation, uh, John's contribution is also huge. Uh, uh, we say in French, incontournable. Uh, in particular, uh, you, we all know about of John's important papers on R&D spillovers, first with Rachel Griffiths and more recently with Nick Bloom and Mark Schenkerman. Uh, where they provide the first serious attempt at measuring R&D spillovers, and you have this beautiful result that the social returns to R&D are two to three times the private returns to R&D, and you are the first to provide this kind of uh, uh, convincing uh, measure of social returns. Uh, I mentioned the Google sites of, of John, and they, uh, and they are on an increasing trend. Uh, 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 more than 30,000 Google sites, more than 20,000 since 2012, many top publications, and uh, every year two or three top publications. Uh, John, you received many awards, in particular the Irio Janssen Award uh, of the Economy, uh, European Economic Association. Uh, Thomson Reuters uh, uh, put you uh, among the most uh, highly cited researchers in economics and business, and there are many and many that I could go on. Uh, I would like just to end with a personal note, <laughs> is how we met. I know you are dreading this. The, in fact, uh, it was a long time ago, like 20, 20 years ago, no, more than 20 years ago, I was working at the EBRD, Oxford and EBRD, and I was working on transition economics, and uh, I was working with Wendy Carlin. And, when, and one day, Wendy said, you know, we could do this paper. I have this student. He's really fantastic. So she came with a, with a, with a, with a, with a guy, but the guy, you could not see his face because he had the tufts of hair all around. So you didn't know where was the back and when was the front. Quoi. So you, you needed to open the curtain, you see what I mean? It's like, oh, wow, here is John. Quoi. And that's how I discovered John von Rinnen. Uh, uh, and that was the beginning of a wonderful collaboration. I, with John, I can tell you, when you work with John, it's fun from uh, beginning to end, and you end up in a top five. Quoi. So I really recommend you to be a co-author of John von Rinnen, because it's a top five, les doigts dans le nez, as we say in French. You see, with uh, good humor, good mood, no fights. Uh, it's very, uh, I recommend it. So without further ado, uh, I leave the floor to John. He will talk to us about productivity, management, and innovation. <laughs> well, I don't, know how, I don't know how to follow that introduction. <laughs> as, as we say, there's only one way, and that's to go down, you know, after the expectations have been risen. But thank you, Philippe. It's uh, a great honor to be here giving the Schumpeter Lecture, not least because of the um, amazing people who have given this lecture before me, including Philippe and, ma and many others. So I'm very honored to uh, get the chance to talk a bit about uh, the work I've been doing and other people have been doing around the issue. I'm going to focus very much around the issue of productivity. And um, the, the kind of reason, that you know, the obvious reason for focusing on thinking about productivity these days is because it, we hear it all the time, both in uh, the academic world, where we are now, but also out there in, um, you know, when we talk to policymakers or to the media, people are very, very concerned about low growth rates, and particularly in low productivity growth rates. So just to give you one example of that, if you look at the kind of G7 countries 
This is the uh, average growth of GDP per capita over the last, um, last 40 or 50 years. And you can see that you know, the last 10 years have been really awful in terms of our kind of growth rates. So part of that, of course, is due to the impact of the Great Recession. But even after the recovery from the Great Recession, as we know, the recovery has been very tepid, very slow, and a lot of that uh, slow recovery has been linked, is very strongly influenced by productivity growth. So understanding how we can get back to sustainable productivity growth, what policies we can use, how we can uh, foster that as academics is extremely important in my opinion. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is, um, first of all, start off with some kind of uh, big picture facts of uh, what we know about productivity both across countries and within countries, both in the cross section over time. And my story is that in order to understand what's happened to productivity, there are two um, important drivers of that. One, classically, is gonna be around technological change, and that's gonna be the first half of the lecture. But in the second half, I'm also going to say that that's a partial approach. We also need to look at the management and organization of firms to understand um, what productivity is and what causes its dispersion. But also importantly, and this is what I'll turn to in the final part of the talk, the implications that has both for the profession, but perhaps more importantly, what policies that we can do to resuscitate productivity growth. Okay, so many of you will have seen graphs like this before. This is um, a, a simple correlation on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis across just about every country in the world. This is a measure of GDP per worker or labor productivity. On the y-axis, on the vertical axis, we have total factor productivity, so that bit of productivity, the bit of output, which is not accounted for by conventional factor inputs like ca physical capital and human capital. And if you look at this, there's two things which are really striking about this graph. First of all, um, there's a very strong correlation between countries which have high TFP and high labor productivity. TFP really is the dominant factor in accounting for, for labor productivity. But secondly, and, and this is, you know, I think even more important, um, I base these in the US. The US is kind of one and countries are relative to the US. And you can see that um, if you look at along the uh, vertical axis here, there's countries down here like Liberia, like Niger, like Sierra Leone, like Tanzania, who have um, one thirty-second of the productivity of the US. So that means that even given the same kind of capital equipment, a US worker can make in a day what it takes a Tanzanian worker to make in a month. That's an enormous difference of uh, total factor productivity. And if we could think about ways to improve the TFP, in um, those poorer countries, that could have an enormous impact on, on poverty rates and, and well-being in the world. Um, so there's a huge spread of productivity between firms. This is actually, if you look within countries, uh, sorry, there's a huge spread of productivity across countries. If you look within countries, you see this mirrored in productivity differences across firms. So Chad Syverson has probably documented this the, the most systematically using kind of U.S. census data. In a typical U.S. four-digit sector, so that's a narrow sector, like, you know, cement or block ice or, or paper. The difference between firms at the 90th and 10th percentiles of the uh, output per worker distribution is there's something like a factor of four. And even when you uh, try and get down to total factor productivity, again, taking out the other kind of inputs, the difference is still a factor of two to one. So even in a single country where we think that markets might be functioning relatively well, like the US, you still see a very big productivity dispersion, a performance differential across different firms and establishments within the very same industry. And if you look in other countries, so Bartelsmann and co-authors have a very nice paper looking across a range of OECD countries, you see even bigger productivity spreads. And if you go to developing countries, like Shea and Kleno have looked at, spreads are even bigger within industries. So there's an enormous uh, heterogeneity of firms uh, in, in terms of within, within, uh, within countries, um, within industries. Now, you know, in, in some level, going, you know, that's the cross-section. If we look at growth rates, then we've known from at least the work of Solo that if we look at the growth rate of productivity, uh, a lot of the growth rate is due to total factor productivity. The growth rate of output is very much driven by TFP changes rather than factor accumulation. A second fact is that, again, if you look in the time series, a lot of the growth rate of TFP 
isn't simply every firm becoming more productive at the same rate. A lot of this is due to this reallocation between firms of different productivity levels. So in particular, low productivity firms shrink and exit, high productivity firms expand and grow. And that reallocation of productivity between heterogeneous firms accounts for something like half of all TFP growth in, in the aggregate level. Um, and you, know, so you see this, Bailey SL did this for the US, but you see similar things in, in, in other countries as well. Now, you know, these facts uh, have been shown to be true today, although if you look at the speed of reallocation in the US, for example, this does seem to have slowed down to some degree. Um, and this may be partly what's behind the uh, slower productivity growth in recent years. So all these facts, these differences across countries, these differences between firms, this reallocation, is very much in the spirit of Schumpeter. So you know, Schumpeter really stressed this in, in his writing, so you know, it's very appropriate to be talking about this. Um, and you know, you know, I, and I'm sure many of you in the room, we you know, use famous quotes from Schumpeter, in particular, this, these processes as I've been describing, um, this kind of motion of the capital, of capitalist economies being to do with the introduction of new products and new firms and the destruction of old ones. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact of capitalism. We often use that quote by Schumpeter. In fact, there's other quotes by Schumpeter probably better known to non-economists. So his most famous quote, I think, was the following. He said, early in life, I had three ambitions. I wanted to be the greatest economist in the world, the best horseman in all of Austria, and the greatest lover in Vienna. So uh, it's good to have ambitions in life. Uh, apparently, the, he said he'd reached two of his goals towards the end of his life, but he never said which two, uh, though he remarked there were too many uh, fine horsemen in Austria for him to achieve all of his aspirations. Uh, and uh, apocryphally, the, it was the response was that those who knew Schumpeter as the economist, lover, or horseman presumed his skill were in the other two fields. So uh, even the greatest economist can be uh, a bit uh, too immodest sometimes. So, you know, so given these facts, what are the reasons for these very large differences in firm and country productivity? How can we kind of understand what these differences are? So um, I'm going to talk first of all about technological innovation. So I kind of started off my work very much inspired by Philippe and other people. Um, and then I'm going to get on to management practices. So in terms of thinking about you know, what lies behind this, these large differences, um, you know, the, I, I put a picture here of one of my kind of other people who have inspired me, apart from Philippe, is like Zvi Grilikis, who very much focused on saying, well, it's all very well talking about total fact of productivity, but this is a kind of unmeasured residual, a measure of ignorance. And it's kind of ironic that we economists tend to put such emphasis on TFP. It's the very same thing econometricians try to minimize when you do uh, some kind of econometric estimation. We kind of put a lot of weight on it. So Grillikis was very much of the spirit of saying we need to go out and get data on technological innovation, looking at, say, inputs into innovation like research and development, outputs from innovation like patenting activity, the diffusion of those innovations around the economy like information and communication technologies, robots, artificial intelligence, and so on. And Grillikis and others have showed there's a very strong correlation between the spread of these new technologies, these measures of new technologies, and, and productivity. So I'm going to give you just two crude views on how we might think about technological progress. When I was uh, at school learning about technology, and this is one tradition in economics, it was very much seen as a kind of exogenous event. It was a kind of brilliance of kind of great, great men, and they were generally uh, emphasized to be men, um, about you know, James Watts in the first Industrial Revolution. More recently, people have emphasized the second Industrial Revolution from about 1870, the, eventually the light bulb by Edison, the internal combustion engine by Carl Benz, the wireless. So Robert Golden very much stresses this in, in, in his book. So this is one view, the kind of brilliant individual inventors exogenously creating new technologies. Now my, I, you know, I think really my work is much more inspired by a kind of second view of endogenous technical change where we think about investments in research and development, investments in innovation as being the rational choice of profit maximizing firms. And you know, the, obviously there's the kind of work of Roma looking at the kind of representative firm and opposite competition point of view. But I think the real way this literature got pushed forward was with Philippe and Peter Howard in the neo schumpeterian approach, which really stresses the importance of entry and exit and, and heterogeneous firms. And one of the uh, implications of this work is that innovation can be influenced by the policy environment. The economic and policy environment can have a first order effect 
on, uh, on innovation, and that makes it an important kind of policy issue to, to think about. If you look at things like uh, research, this is a simple measure of uh, research and development expenditure as a proportion of GDP by country, you can see why might people might think this. So countries which were high in those productivity rankings also tended to spend a lot more on R&D. So the United States, for example, is quite R&D intensive. Amongst OECD countries, the UK is less R&D intensive. Um, Southern European countries tend to spend less on R&D and they're less productive than, than uh, the other countries are. So this kind of does give some suggestive evidence of at the macroeconomic level of research and development being important. Um, and this has kind of inspired governments to try and enact many policies to influence innovation in various ways. So one way is to actually give direct grants to firms, you know, industrial policies, policies towards energy and defense are two examples of that. Um, there's a set of indirect policies around the tax, the fiscal system, in order to incentivize firms to do more R&D. And then there's much more general ways through the intellectual property system, the supply of skills, product market competition. But with all these, the big question to me really is, you know, which of these really work empirically? There's many policies, but we have much less compelling evidence, or we did have much less compelling evidence until recently, of which of these policies were the most effective. So I'm going to talk about, um, this works, yeah. So I'm going to talk about, uh, one policy uh, which you know I've looked at, and I, I would say you know has a lot of uh, has, a, has has had a lot of empirical work done recently, uh, which is research and development tax credits. So these are ways of uh, trying to incentivize more research and development through the tax system. Um, if you look at OECD countries over time, um, the money spent on uh, R and D in terms of policy has shifted much more towards these tax-based incentives and away from giving direct grants to firms. Um, and, you know, there's probably three reasons for this. One is that an attraction of tax credits is that they're performed by the private sector rather than by the public sector. Um, there is no need for the government to explicitly choose projects, so it economizes and lots of the cost of bureaucracy and information. And it also mitigates the risk of political capture. If you're deciding who to give money to as a state, there's always a risk that the corporations that you're giving money to could, um, you know, capture that and extract more of the rent from, from the government. However, there are disadvantages we've got to be aware of. It's a very blunt tool. So if you read, so, you know, the, the reason that we might think we want to subsidize R&D is because of the um, public good nature of R&D, the ideas that we get spill over to others. We might not mind that as, uh, as, you know, as researchers. The Google citations thing Philly mentioned is very, very good. But on the other hand, if you're a firm, and you're investing in research and development, the fact that other firms gain benefits from your research and development is going to mean that you optimally underinvest, which is the reason the social return may be greater than the private return. If you could focus your spending more on those externality creating activities, that would, that would clearly be better, and the R&D tax credit doesn't do necessarily a very good job of that. Uh, a second big problem is that won't firms just relabel their existing activities? So if you give a tax break for research and development, suddenly firms might start calling uh, what they call marketing or consultancy research and development just to take advantage to get more money from, from the government. Uh, and a third issue is it's, it's narrow. So maybe, you know, if you have many, much, uh, not all innovations, research and development, and by just focusing on a narrow kind of research development, you may be missing out a lot of innovation such as in the service sector. So how, how can we actually try and identify the effects of research development tax credits? Well, there's been four broad methodologies which have uh, been attempted. So one, when I first started doing this with kind of Rachel Griffith and uh, Nick Bloom, when he was a PhD student, we uh, tried to just come up with some measures at the country level of research and development tax credits. And we looked over time across many countries with kind of cost quantity panel data regression and found there were effects, uh, which were kind of encouraging but of course, the concern is there's many other things happening at the economy-wide level you can't control for. So one, one second strategy to deal with that is to look within a country. So um, there's some very nice work by Dan Wilson who looks at the kind of state-specific R&D tax credits in the US and then looks over time as um, tax incentives have been brought in and removed across states and then again shows that there's some effects on research and development because of that. Again, although that's in some sense an improvement, the downside is that there still could be many other things happening at the state level that you can't, uh, you can't fully control for. 
So the other kind of method, and this is, I think, the most productive way going forward, is to try and use firm-level data. So I think one of the earliest examples of this was kind of Bronwyn Hall's work, where she noticed that the US federal tax system created a lot of nonlinearities, created a lot of different heterogeneous effects of the tax credit across different firms, and could use firm-level data to see whether firms responded to those different incentives. So for example, if you were tax exhausted, if you weren't earning any profits, a tax credit wasn't so much use to you as it would be if you were earning lots of profits and you had lots of corporate taxes. So you know, she and others have tried to use that and shown that there was effects from that. But of course, the problem is, you know, if you think about that, the reason for those heterogeneities across firms can be very endogenous. So you know, if you're tax exhausted, you're probably a very different firm facing different shocks from firms which are earning a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of corporate profits. So in the, the, the paper, I spent a little, bit of, a little bit of time on a recent paper that I've been doing with uh, a range of, of co-authors, where what we try to use is a regression discontinuity design. So we try and exploit some of the features of the tax system to create nonlinearities, which can create a regression discontinuity. So uh, uh, RDDs are very, are very sexy at the moment, as you probably know. And in fact, the title of this paper is fantastic. So we call it an RDD for R&D. So you know, you can you know that once you've got that, you've got you've got the paper written basically. Uh, but let me show you a little bit more about how how, how we do this. So um, what happened in the UK was that in 2008. Um, they changed the R&D tax credit system. So like most countries, the UK has a more generous tax system for small firms than large firms, you know, mainly because it's co concerned about financial constraints for small firms. So, they so small firms are defined um, in relation to various criteria, but one criteria is the assets. So what happened in 2008 is that the UK government expanded the asset criteria so that many firms overnight who before were classified as large firms became reclassified as small firms because the amount of assets that they had uh, enabled them to, uh, to get access to the R&D tax credit. It basically doubled the, uh, the, the kind of threshold for the asset criteria. So that's, that's a very useful thing for the econometrician because suddenly you've kind of randomized the whole group of firms in to the tax credit system who haven't done anything else. And uh, you know, we can exploit that discontinuity. We can look around that border just above and below this new threshold and see if firms just above the threshold respond in a different way to firms just below the threshold. So um, this is what it looks like. So we, we, uh, the tax changes in 2008, very luckily the definition of whether you were small or large was partially based on 2007 assets. So this is assets before firms knew that this new tax regime would come in. We can test that by looking at whether firms were different around the 2007 asset threshold. They weren't, there's no reason why they should be. But after 2008, this is data from 2009 to 2011, you can see that the R&D of the firms uh, who were just below the threshold looks really unusually high compared to firms just above the threshold. These are firms who are not eligible and these are firms who are newly eligible. And you can see, although bigger firms do more R&D, there's this very strong break just exactly at the threshold. And this is a big difference. It's about double what the mean R&D was. So this has, a, has had a you know, very large impact on firms' R&D. Now, you might, and th you know, this is kind of what most of the literature has done so far, but you might say, well, so what? You know, firms have these incentives to relabel things to be R&D. What we really care about is, are there any effects on productivity, on innovation, on other kinds of aspects. So we look at those in the paper and we find indeed it's not just R&D which changes, but over the course of the next few years, uh, other things change as well. Employment went up, productivity went up. Here's the picture for patents as one measure of innovation. Um, this is, uh, you can do the site weight, it doesn't make much difference. Um, but you can see that just as, as with R&D, over the next few years, there was this kind of increase of patenting activity. That's about a 60% increase the amount of patents activity generated just around this kind of threshold. So this does look very much like a kind of causal impact of uh, the R&D policy on not just R&D, but also on innovation as well. Now, of course, you know, if we have these policies that seem to increase R&D, we can also use these to assess the impact of R&D on productivity, because we can use these, uh, these discontinuities or other designs to instrument the R&D 
in the innovation or the, the, the productivity equation and get the causal impact of R&D on, on, on productivity and TFP. And we do this and we show that, in fact, people may have underestimated the importance of, uh, of R&D for productivity. And another way, and you know, uh, Philippe mentioned this as well, we also try and exploit this in our kind of econometric piece uh, with Mark Shankman and Nick Bloom. So in the US, these R, as I mentioned, these R&D tax credits have been introduced at different times in different states. And because for some, you know, some firms operate in some states, not others, some big firms of R&D labs spread across different, different states in the US prior to the policy change, we can, uh, sh you know, we show that firms which were lucky enough to, say, be in California, when California introduced a tax credit, responded more with the R&D and also more with the, the kind of innovation. But we try and we can actually go beyond that because we can look not just at the effect on the firm itself, but also on other firms. And, you know, as Philippe mentioned, you know, this is the critical thing because in terms of thinking about um, policy interventions, what we care about is whether or is how big the spillover is from one firm to, to another firm. Um, so, you know, in the literature, of course, there's, these, there's actually two offsetting effects. So there's the kind of positive effect, the kind of fact that, you know, Philippe has a great idea and I benefit from those ideas if we're close to technology space. On the other hand, Philippe might publish his paper first and, you know, get there before me. And this is like the business stealing effect. So this is how firms grab market shares. If that big business stealing effect is very large, that can actually mean that there's too big an incentive to do R&D. There's a kind of arms war effect where you can actually get the private return exceeding the social return. So, that's a, so it's very important to kind of separate these two spillover effects out. So the way that we try and do this is to exploit the fact that firms operate in multiple technologies and multiple industries. And although um, many firms are actually you know, working in the same technology class and the same product market class, often firms can be competing in the same industry but using the very different technology. So an example would be thinking about TV sets. So you have your plasma TVs and your LED te techniques using very different technologies. So even though these firms are competing in the product market, they're getting their technologies from very different parts of the product, uh, very, very different types of technology. So activity in the kind of plasma technology will maybe have a positive um, technological spillover, but R&D by TV, by TV firms is going to have a more uh, effect than just business dealing. So we can use these networks across different technology classes and different, different kind of product markets to separate out these two different effects. And kind of what we find is, exactly, is very much in line with the theory. So if we look at the spillover from other firms research and development, uh, it has a positive effect on your market value. So if there's, you know, if there's r and going on in areas where we're both working the same technology, this has a, a positive effect. Um, both on market value, on TFP, and on patents by technological spillovers. But if there's R&D going on um, in firms close to you in the product market, just in your product market, where you're not using the same technologies, then it actually has a negative effect on your, on your market value. It's a kind of business dealing effect. So we find evidence for both of these going on in the data. But importantly, um, the positive technology spillover effect dominates quantitatively. I mean, it's different in different industries and heterogeneity, but on average across the economy, um, technology has this positive uh, effect. So the social returns to R&D is much bigger than the private return, something like two to three times bigger, and this justifies the kind of policies to uh, intervene to subsidize research and development. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's part of the positive story. I kind of, you know, an, an issue here is that, with, you know, these type of policies like R&D tax credits or other kinds of R&D subsidies are giving incentives for firms to do more R&D, increasing demand for R&D. And there is a concern at the general equilibrium level that if the supply of uh, inputs to R&D is very inelastic, this could actually mean that these subsidies actually go more towards increasing the price rather than increasing the volume. So scientists' wages might, might go up. Now, you might think that's great. We like our, we like our wages going up. But uh, from the point of view of the average citizen, you know, to spend a lot of money on R&D subsidies and they all to end up in the pocket of researchers is not what, the, uh, not what the game is about. So a better policy in some sense would be to operate on the supply side. Could we increase the quantity and quality of people entering into the R&D sector, into the innovation sector? Because this would increase the volume of R&D because you have more people. And because of this, there'll be an increase of supply, this should actually reduce the cost. But you know, to do this, we have to go back to this kind of individual base. You know, what makes an inventor? What can the government, if anything, do to influence this? And you might think, well, is there anything the government can do? 
So in some recent work with uh, Raz Chetty, Alex Bell, uh, Xavier uh, Jaravel, and Nikova Petkoffer, we tried to uh, tackle some of these issues. We matched in uh, every, um, every inventor from patents in the US uh, from 1996, from the US Patent Office to the tax records by name and residence. That's basically the population. And then we documented that um, several things. So one of those is that people from disadvantaged groups are much less likely to grow up to be inventors. Women are less likely to, be, to grow up to be inventors than men. Minorities are less likely than, uh, than whites. And also that if you're born into a low-income family, you're much less likely to become an inventor than if you're born into a high-income family. Um, and if, at the same, you know, there's also work by Philippe at the same time, looking at Finnish data, who's found very complementary results to this. So it seems you know, there's, a, there's a new kind of wave of this work coming out looking at kind of individual, uh, in, in individual uh, ways of trying to think about invention, which seems to be coming up with similar results. So just to show you one example of that, this plots out um, whether or not you grew up to be an inventor, this is an invention rate per thousand, based on what your parental income was. So, in percent, so you can see, uh, you know, if you were born into a family in the top 1% of the income distribution, uh, you're an order of magnitude 10 times more likely to grow up to be an inventor than if you were born to someone in the bottom 50%. So that's a very, very big difference. Now, you know, obviously ability matters for this. So you might think, well, maybe, you know, rich people are, are just smarter, their kids are smarter, and that's why they are more, are more likely to be inventors. And there is some evidence of this. So we have ability measures such as the math scores at third grade. But Whatever you use, it can only account for a relatively uh, uh, small fraction of this. So maybe up to 30% of this inventor parental income relationship could be due to ability. Uh, almost nothing of the gender gap can be accounted for, for by this. What we do find seem, seems to matter a lot more is being exposed to innovation when you were a child. So if you're exposed to more in, in inventors, whether it's in your neighborhood that you're growing up in, in your family or by mentors, it actually seems to have a much bigger effect on whether or not you grow up to be an inventor. And this looks like as a causal effect, we can, you know, we don't have a natural experiment, but we can look within very narrow technology classes. So for example, we can show that growing up in an area like Silicon Valley, doesn't just make you more likely to be an inventor, it makes you more likely to be an inventor in a particular software class relative to, say, medical devices. Or, you know, if you, if you grew up in an area which was, um, had a lot of rubber, synthetic rubber inventors, it makes you more likely to grow up and innovate in synthetic rubber rather than non-synthetic rubber. So I doubt whether there's a gene which codes for those type, of, uh, those type of abilities to innovate. So it does have the suggestion of uh, causality. And we try in the paper to also quantify a structural model of an inventor life cycle using the things in our data. And we show that you know, policies which can get disadvantaged kids more into innovation by you know, giving them greater exposure, maybe putting them in different talented programs like the, um, the kind of experimental evidence in Card and Giuliani, can have very big effects on welfare. And often these policies, like uh, these educational intervention policies, are seen as things for equity, which they are. But we show that there are also things which can actually improve in the long run the level of productivity and growth by improving the quality of people and the quantity of people who go into the innovation sector. So, you know, this, so I, I set up this with this kind of these two views, the endogenous growth view and the kind of exogenous individual view. In fact, you know, even if in, in this kind of individual view there's an endogenous element to it, policies can affect this, and it doesn't mean the government can do nothing even if you thought that a lot of this is about individual, individual choices. So to summarize, um, it, on, on the technological innovation side, it does seem like technology matters a lot for productivity. Uh, Microdata and better identification strategies suggest that policies can be effective. And this is true whether one takes a more individual-based exogenous view or the kind of endogenous growth approach. However, I think there's kind of two problems with this kind of pure technology story for explaining the patterns I began the talk with uh, on firm and country productivity. First of all, even after controlling for technology in any way you can do, um, it's still the case that there's a lot of unexplained productivity differences. So just an example, if you look in the US Census, going back to accounting for the differences between the 90-10, the productivity spread between the, uh, the firms, the establishments, the 90th percentile versus the 10th percentile, you can only explain maybe 17% with R&D, maybe 8% with information technology. That's a lot of um, uh, amount which is still unexplained, even with any technology measure you can use. 
Secondly, um, if you look at the micro studies, which have looked at the impact of new technology on productivity, a lot of that, the first thing you see is there's a, a, big, there's a very big difference in the impact of, of, uh, on productivity. So there is an impact, but it differs a lot between different types of firms. And in particular, uh, firms with, um, with different types of management practice or organization seem to be much better at using many of these new technologies than other firms. So that's been documented uh, you know, in, many, in many different countries at this point. So this is going to suggest that another source of productivity differences is important. It's not just technology. And we should also think about the management and organization of, of firms. So I'm going to turn to that now. Um, the, you know, in, in some ways, it's unsurprising. I often use this other quote when I, when I, teach, uh, I teach organizational economics to the uh, MIT economics students uh, on the PhD program. And I often start, you know, I said, you know, here's a great quote. It says that, you know, on account of the wide range of manager abilities that we see firm, a lot of differences in firm performance. And I said, this is a paper by Francis Walker in the QJ in 87. They look at me, you know, Professor Van Rien, and no one reads articles, you know, which are 40 years old. You know, as you're, you're from the age of the dinosaurs. Why should we bother reading these very old articles? And I mentioned that this was actually in 1887. This uh, quote comes from uh, Walker's piece in the first ever volume of the QJ. Uh, Francis Walker was, uh, he was the uh, first president of the American Economic Association, he's the president of uh, MIT, and he also ran the 1880 census in the US. You can see he's the very picture of a kind of uh, dismal looking economist here, obviously with some census return forms obviously weighing him down. So, you know, Walker made this point, and you know, the MIT seems to be particularly ashamed of themselves because there's a big Walker memorial that you have to walk past every day on the way into MIT. Um, but, you know, I think to give, it, to, give, to give them some credit, I mean, the, the evidence, although you know, Walker suggested this, there really wasn't very good empirical evidence that management mattered. There's a, well, there's a huge number of case studies. So, you know, if you, this is an example of a bookstore in San Francisco in the airport. You know, you can see all over the place, you know, Steve Jobs and, you know, uh, Richard Branson, Amazon. So lots of case studies. But, you know, the problem with the case study is it has a very small sample size of one, and that sample is usually highly selected. So, you know, in his survey in, in 2011, Chad Syverson correctly said that there's no potential driving force of productivity has seen a higher ratio of speculation to empirical study. Um, you know, management has, has really uh, not, not really been able to, although people have thought it matters, there's, there's uh, not much empirical evidence. So, yeah, one example of this was... Uh, Enron. I remember there was, a, I, you know, I was working with someone at McKinsey, and uh, he was saying, you know, what a wonderful. He had this example of this wonderful company with great management practices, and you know, it was really the future of uh, the way to organize a firm. And that firm was Enron, uh, and this was at the same time that Enron, the you know, the CEO and the CFO of Enron were being tried and subsequently put in jail. So much so that people wanted to change the Enron sign from the E to something more appropriate. Um, and it just went to show that, you know, case studies, you know, although they have their uses, they're pretty limited. So, you know, economists have thought about management for a long time. Well, you know, when I teach management, um, I often contrast these two views. So one view, I, I, you could call this management design. So in, in this view, and this is the standard org econ view, is that, you know, there's no sense in which any type of management is better or worse. It, they all have optimal styles. They depend on the environments that they're put in. So that's the kind of standard view, and it's a very powerful view of thinking about different types of practices of pay and other forms of performance. In, in the management science literature, this is associated with Woodward uh, from 1958. But I think it's a kind of partial view. Um, and I think although it's very powerful and it has some purchase on, on the data, I think there's an alternative view, um, which I know is the best way of describing it, but we sometimes call this the manual as a technology view or the map view, which is that there are some types of management practices which tend to increase productivity across a very wide range of industries, countries, and firms. So much so that we might even think about this as managerial capital, which belongs into the, into the production function. And there's a, there's a long tradition in, that, you know, in economics of thinking of this in this way. Um, so you know, in a recent paper with uh, Raphael Assad and Nick Bloom, we've, we've tried to kind of put these views, we've tried to formalize this view a bit. So you know, the, in this type of model, we have firms entering an industry. They take a drawer of productivity from a, from a known distribution. 
Um, so this is very much like Hoppenheim or Mellets. But then once they actually are in the industry, they can optimally uh, make decisions over factor inputs, and those include management. So you could think about trying to improve your management capital by hiring different types of uh, senior managers, by spending money on management consultants, by changing the amount of time people work on production versus managerial tasks. So if we think about management in that way, then it both has an exogenous element and also an endogenous element where management capital can be chosen and invested in subject to adjustment costs. So you know, this will give you heterogeneity, give imperfect competition, so it's not that the most productive firm always takes over the whole industry. And that kind of simple kind of model has several implications, which has put, we seem to have purchased in the data. So well, I'll show you a couple of things. One is that we should, you should expect to see the firms with um, better management to have higher performance. We should expect to see tougher product market competition also being associated with improved management practices, both through selection and also incentives. And we should also see management changing with the age of the firm through a selection effect and also with the cost of managerial skills. So you know, we find evidence, and I'll show you some of this, for both you know, design perspectives as well as this, this kind of map perspective. But at least in our data, which I'll describe in a second, the, uh, the management technology seems to fit the data better. So both of these seem to be important. So let me t tell you a little bit about this uh, data that we have. So apologies to you who have seen this before. So how do we measure management? It's very difficult to do. We have three parts of this. So one is we develop a set of questions. We have basically these 18 questions. Um, one set of questions is around monitoring, the collection, use of information. I'll give you an example in a minute. The second thing is about target setting. Are your targets stretching, or are they too easy or, or too difficult? And a whole set of questions around people management, how people are paid, how they're promoted, how they're retained and hired. And we implement this through about a 45-minute uh, telephone interview of manufacturing plant managers. So these are the guys in the middle of the organization. They, they, they have a, you know, the CEO is great to talk to, but often doesn't know what's going on. The person at the bottom has a hard, it's harder to take a view of the firm as a whole. So these are very useful people to talk to. As I'll say, I'll give you a couple of examples in a minute. And we try to get um, accurate responses by the interviewers don't know the company's performance. It's blind on the side of the people who are, who are doing the interviews. The managers themselves are not informed, so they're, they're not being told that they're going to be scored across these different dimensions to avoid psychological bias. We ran all these from the LSE in the same place. Um, it's a voluntary survey. We get a pretty good sample of response rate of about 45%. It looks balanced on all the observables. Um, and we, you know, we, got a, we got this good response rate by using several tricks. So one is we had, the, uh, we had endorsement letters from reputable institutions. So the Bank of England, uh, we had the Bundesbank in Germany. Germans are a very respectful authority. When they saw this, the double-headed Prussian uh, headed note paper from the uh, Bundesbank, they responded very well. We found the letter from the Federal Reserve in America worked very badly. The Americans don't seem to like the governments. We had obscenity shouted down the phone at us, you know, liberal, communist, the phone was slammed down. We found with Americans what works much better is the fact we had uh, MBA students, they're very persistent, they didn't take like didn't like to take no for an answer, and this kind of worked a lot better with the Americans. So very much horses for courses, but the, uh, the, the response rates uh, looked, looked pretty good. They were kind of balanced at about 45%. So here's the kind of, some of the kind of things that we're trying to get at. So this is not seen, this, this is seen by the, uh, the inter, in, not seen by the person we're interviewing, just by the person who's the analyst who's doing the interview. So we're, we're, for example, in the monitoring section, a low score, we, can, we score between one through to five, a low score would be, you know, measures are not tracked um, uh, well and not related to business objectives, whereas a high score would be where performance is, ma is monitored very frequently and is, is made, made visual to, uh, to people working on the shop floor. So, you know, here's an example of that from a Toyota plant in Ohio. You can see that, you know, at the back of this, uh, this guy is working, there's information, uh, this is updated very frequently, the information is being tracked well, and so on. So if you're interested, I haven't really got time to go into it in a lot of detail, but if you are interested, this is all open source, both in the methodology and the data. You can download it from our website, the World Management Survey. We now have about 12,000 firms. We've interviewed about 20,000 managers in four major waves over time. It's kind of panel data and cross-sectional data across 34 countries. And all, you, know, you should think about a typical firm here is having about 250 employees. It's a kind of medium-sized firm. We've, although you know, we, we started off doing this in manufacturing, 
um, you can use the same type of thing. So the questions on, you know, when you're promoting people, do you take into account the effort and ability, or do you just promote based on tenure, questions like that, you can use those anywhere. So we actually have used this in hospitals, as well as in retail sectors and schools and many other places. So what are these, uh, you know, I, I, well, I said, what are the good things about this, actually, is that, you know, you get unexpected things when you're talking to people. So, you know, one of the good things about doing this type of research is that people say things that you don't expect. So one of the uh, funny things is that, uh, you know, one of the production managers tried to chat up one of the people doing the interview. So uh, he was talking to an Australian. This is a British manager talking to an Australian female interviewer. Your accent is really cute. I love the way you talk. Do you fancy meeting up near the factory? Who could refuse such a generous offer? But our interviewer did. Sorry, I'm washing my hair every night for the next month. Uh, now, things are di culture is different in different countries, of course, as you know. So that was in Britain. In India, it's something that's quite different. So the production manager asked, are you a Brahmin? Which is a kind of high caste person. And the interviewer, who's a woman, said, yes, why do you ask? The production manager said, are you married? The interviewer, no, excellent, excellent. My son is looking for a bride. I think you could be perfect. I must contact your parents to discuss this. So you can see, you know, culture matters in these things as well as uh, technology and economics. So we've collected all this data. What does it look like? So the first thing we did was we have 18 questions. We, we do various things. We, you know, we compute an average score. And then we look across different countries. So if you kind of rank the countries, the ranking is kind of what you might expect. So you see the, um, you know, you know, the US comes top, but then you have other very well-performing countries like Japan, Germany, and Sweden, very up near the top there. As you go down, you get some more Western European countries. Southern European countries, Portugal is kind of down here, uh, not doing too badly. Then you get emerging economies like China and India, and then Latin America, poor Latin American economies and African economies at the bottom. And if you line that up against the kind of GDP capita numbers, there's a reasonably, you know, re there's a reasonably good correlation between the two. It's obviously nothing causal here, but an interesting correlation nonetheless suggests there may be information and data. Now, of course, as I'm more of a micro person, a macro person, um, you know, I want to use the micro data here. So the next thing we did was just to look at the distributions. And what you see here is the distribution across firms within each country. And what's very striking is just this enormous variation. So in every country, take, take, take two countries like uh, the US and India, it's not like every Indian firm has terrible scores and every American firm has great scores. Although the average is higher in the US and India, there's a lot of American firms with very poor scores, not tracking what's going on, setting unrealistic targets, you know, promoting people irrespective of merit. And in Indian firms, um, there's, you know, there's several very high, good high quality firms. So we can exploit this micro variation in the data and that's what I'm going to do in terms of looking at management and performance. So the first thing we looked at is just the correlation between management and size. So the better managed firms tend to be larger. That's one measure of performance. Of course, you might think, well, the causality can go both ways. Maybe it's just that the large firms can, you know, this is a fixed cost of management, the large firms can invest more in it. So we also looked at kind of productivity, total factor productivity, and you see there's a pretty strong positive correlation just in the raw data between management and, uh, and TFP. Um, I should also mention that, you know, we've also now done surveys in the U.S. and other countries using uh, more conventional methods, more kind of standard paper and pen methods or email questions, uh, working with different censuses. We've actually, here's one from the U.S. where we have 48,000 responses in uh, 2011. We've done another survey now. The great thing about this uh, more conventional approach is that we get a very high response rate. So in the U.S., it says, your response is required by law on these survey forms. That is good for your response rate. So uh, we got a pretty good response rate. And whether you look at the census data or you look at the World Management Survey data, you see a very similar thing. So in the census data, you also see a very strong correlation between the management scores, productivity, profits, growth, innovation, and so on. So, you know, and you see this not just in the cross-section, but also when you look in the panel and look at changes over time. So that's all encouraging. However, you know, the big issue is causality. Even in, the, even in the panel data, looking at firms which introduce better management practices and you see a subsequent increase in productivity, it could be some omitted third factor we're not controlling for. So in order to try and address that, the best way to try and address that is to run randomized control trials. And fortunately now we have a few of these coming in. So um, 
um, Nick Bloom and co-authors have done a very nice study looking in India. They uh, gave uh, some, they marketed a program with the World Bank which offered free management consultancy uh, to Indian textile firms outside Mumbai. People applied for that and they randomized some firms into a treatment group who got five months intervention of injecting the kind of Bloom Van Rienen management practices. And then there was a, a control group which got a one month intervention basically just to collect the data. So you can simply compare the treatment with control to see what the impact might have been of these management practices. And the results were very striking. The management practices scores improved dramatically by something like two standard deviations. Total fat products have increased by something like 20%. Profits increased by something like 325,000 even in the first year, and now we have some longer-term evidence of that. Those seem to be persistent. Interestingly, these, the RCT evidence lies somewhere between the kind of panel data estimates and the cross-sectional estimates. So the non-experimental data seems to be consistent with the with the, uh, the more causal evidence from the RCTs. So you know, this is just to show you that you know, this is the improvement in the treatment plants co compared to the control plants. So that's very that's very encouraging. Um, there's, several other, there's a couple of other studies which have now come out. There's a nice study by um, Antoinette Schoer, my, uh, my co-author, my um, colleague at MIT, who's looked in Mexico at some big management interventions. Roland Fryer has got a recent paper looking in US public uh, schools, which has also introduced many of these type of management practices and also found very positive effects on kids' test score results. Um, you know, not all interventions work, so some of the lower cost interventions uh, don't see, see, see more mixed results. So there's a very nice survey by McKenzie and Woodruff looking at those. So you know, what seems to be coming out of this is that it's, it's, you, know, you need to kind of have a quite a serious intervention if you want to um, see, see effects in the data of, of management. But we can, what we can do is we can combine some of these micro results with the kind of model I sketched out. And we show that um, <clears throat> management can account for quite a lot of this, this productivity dispersion. So maybe a, a third of the cross-country TFP differences and about a third of the within-country cross-firm differences can be accounted for by management practices. Um, so this is just an example of uh, looking in the cross-country dimension. It's a kind of development accounting uh, approach which suggests that you know, on average about a third of the TFP gap in the US uh, seems to be accounted for by these measures of management practices. So it, it's different in different countries. It's going to more in the OECD countries, less than developing countries, which obviously have bigger problems. But it does suggest that management matters quantitatively in terms of thinking about these productivity dispersion across countries, which I began the talk with. So let me end by um, thinking about, in this, in this management section, about what drives management practices. If these practices are so beneficial for productivity, and why, why isn't it the case that more firms aren't adopting them? And I think that, you know, th that question, which I think is one of the first order questions in, in economics and social science, is very much like the question that people often pose about any new technology. It's very striking when we think about the spread of new technologies, think about Gula Keys' hybrid corn, to modern debates on ICT and computers and artificial intelligence, that firms adopting, adopt at very different, re diff different rates even though this, they seem to be quite beneficial uh, in many cases. And so that question about why aren't firms adopting more, um, often you know, one way to think about this is that, you know, one question is that I have, may not have the information. So if I'm poorly managed, I may not know how poorly managed I am. Many of these Indian te textile firms didn't talk to many other firms. It may be that I know I'm badly managed, but I don't know how to change it. I don't know how to improve. And that might be a question of human capital. It might be a question of... Uh, needing a, a better kind of consultancy industry. I may know I'm bad, I may know how to improve, I may not be incentivized to improve. So it may be, be, there may be weak competition, there may be ownership and regulation problems. And finally, even if I know I have full information and I'm well incentivized, the decision may not just be me as an individual decision theoretic problem. I may need to take the whole organization with me. Think about changing an economics department from your home institution. It's not just the head of departments who makes the decision. He has to take his senior colleagues with him. So all these factors, I think, play in. I don't think we've got the magic bullet answer to this. But the data does give us some clues towards those different aspects. So I think information is, is a really important thing here. So you know, I met there's this, there's this great book, if you haven't read it, called Moneyball about how information was used to improve, improve baseball. Uh, in our survey, we asked a question right at the end where we said, excluding yourself, how well or badly managed would you say your firm is on a scale of one to 10? One is worst, five is average, and 10 is the best. Unsurprisingly, you know, 80% of people thought they were above average. 
just as we think our driving is above average or our kids are above average. So, you know, there's, there's certainly, you know, an exaggeration. But, you know, that, you might say that's just a, a general psychological bias. You know, if you look at the correlation with productivity, maybe you still see a, a relationship. In fact, this question is totally uninformative. So we don't find that, the, uh, that people are, are very, so are very aware of how well or badly managed they are. You know, whereas our method found a very strong relationship when you really probe, just asking these simple questions reveals that maybe people don't know so much information. So I think information is a really big issue. A second striking thing from the data is looking at um, foreign multinationals. So most of these firms are domestic firms. Um, and you can see this just lines up the, the blue line just shows you the average management scores of domestic firms across countries. So you can see that looks very much like the overall picture I showed you. But if you look at the foreign multinationals, these are subsidiaries and branches of the foreign multinationals, they seem to be, have much better management practices, um, no matter which country they're located in, except for maybe the most poor countries. And that does suggest you know, there's a sense of transplanting better management practices across countries. So multinationals seem to be able to overcome some of the environmental difficulties by having better information or better access to human capital. A third thing is competition. So competition seems to be one of the strongest drivers of management practice. So uh, here's a very simple measure of competition, which is the number of rivals that you think you face. Management scores increase very strongly in that. Uh, we also have some more causal evidence. We can use some natural experiments to generate exogenous changes in competition. So one of the big competitive shocks that the West has faced has been China. So in some work with the Merco Draker, we've used China's accession to WTO which had heterogeneous effects across countries. Quotas were phased in out of um, different industries at different times. And we show that in those industries which were more uh, strongly affected by Chinese competition, there was the biggest improvement in management. Of course, there was also a shakeout of employment. And we showed that the firms uh, um, which lost most employment were also the ones which were badly managed and had lower productivity. But of the ones who survived, they're the ones who managed to improve their management practices most strongly. We also have evidence um, from using public sector reforms, so using kind of the hospital management data um, and using some of the reforms in the Blair period, uh, so we can show using kind of political economy instruments that places which for exogenous reasons had more or less competition also were the ones which had better management practices. Um, a fourth kind of thing is on um, family firms. So, uh, you know, what are the, if you want to ruin your firm, give it to your eldest son, as would be the <laughs> summary of this. So if you uh, look at different types of governance and ownership structures and look at the average management score, um, being a family-owned firm, if you have an external CEO, is not so bad. You know, you get a, reason, a reasonably good score. But if you have a family-owned firm and you start appointing uh, the family as the CEO, you have a family member as the CEO, then you can often get very negative outcomes. So as Warren Buffett said, of all the people in the world who could be the best person to run a, a firm, is it going to be your eldest son? Um, and the answer is generally no. Um, and you can see that you know, the, this kind of primogenitor thing is usually associated with rather poor outcomes, which is you know, why we moved from monarchy to democracy, maybe, of the sorts. Uh, and then finally, um, human capital matters a lot. So this just looks at the correlation between uh, the percentage of people who have college degrees. It's kind of unsurprising maybe that you know, when managers are, are more well-educated, the management score is higher, but also when non-managers are well-educated, the management score is higher as well. And I think this, this speaks to the idea that if you want to introduce better management practices, having high human capital amongst your workers makes it a lot easier. So a lot of these, these better practices come from uh, the Toyota production system, and in Japan, there's a big emphasis on having uh, you know, very highly, highly motivated, highly qualified uh, production workers working in your, in your firm. Uh, with some work with David Card, we've tried to press this a bit further, looking at kind of unobserved individual effects using um, very big data sets where your firms and individuals match together. And it turns out that having um, highly skilled workers, both on observable and unobservable dimensions, is strongly associated with better management practices. Uh, both from you know, better, better managed firms selecting better workers and managers, but they also train up workers and train up managers so that they work better when they're in those firms. So all those are kind of factors which seem to be important drivers of management. So let me just end with some of the implications of you know, what, what all this means. Um, I'd say, you know, in, in some ways, you know, there, we're at a time when there's a lot of pessimism around. 
uh, because of our slow productivity growth, and that's engendered a lot of social and political problems. I think if you take away one message from this talk, I'd say that the slow productivity growth is not inevitable. There are many policy levers that we have uh, not sufficiently used, which can be uh, implemented to improve, uh, improve productivity and the, and the well-being of people. So on the technology side, there are a lot of ways of thinking about tax-based innovation policies which have shown to be effective. Uh, I'd also emphasize kind of human capital interventions at early ages for disadvantaged kids, which could have benefits not just for equity I've shown, but also for long-term growth rates. And on the management side, I mean, there are many things, as I've shown you, which we think matter for competition, matter for management. So strengthening product market competition, being open to trade and open to foreign direct investment are very important drivers. So at the moment, where there is a, a big pushback against that for many leaders, especially in, in Britain and America, where you know, free trade is under threat, there's a big anti-globalization movement. Uh, I think we know we as economists have to uh, you know, look to this evidence and say, well, you know, if you enact those type of policies, you're quite likely to, have to make the problem of low productivity even worse. Also, as I've emphasized, there's a role for human capital and also a role for advice and information. That's not something which uh, has been looked at enough, I think, in the literature. So I think, you know, we do live in this golden age. I've shown you this, that we have this, um, these amazing uh, data sets, these very rich micro data sets we can now use to address these first order macro and micro questions. And we need to use these tools to get back to sustainable productivity growth and income growth, which I think is, is not uh, beyond uh, the wit of man to do. So let me just end finally with, uh, uh, you know, for those junior researchers in the audience, uh, you know, it, I would encourage you to think about going out and getting your own data because you really do find things that you don't expect. So, uh, for example, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is that you might think defining ownership in Europe is easy, but uh, one production manager was very honest with us. He said, we are owned by the mafia in Italy. And the interviewer got very nervous and said, I think that's in the other category, although I could put you down as an Italian multinational. So if you <laughs> download the data, you can try and guess which one that is. Uh, so, you know, as, as, uh, uh, you know I, I live, uh, I live in, in, uh, in Boston now. And of course, there's many good things about America, but there are some rather bad things. You know, my daughter goes to a public school, and I have to say, geography lessons are not all they might be. And uh, we saw that very vividly in one of the interviews where we said, you know, how many production sites do you have abroad? And the manager in Indiana says, uh, well, yeah, we have one in Texas, which uh, apparently is the right answer, uh, you know, for people who live there. And, you know, not, I don't want to think that, you know, I'm just knocking America. Uh, you know, you, you might worry in my own country when you uh, get sick. So we asked one interviewer, do staff sometimes end up doing the wrong sort of work for their skills? The manager said, you mean like doctors doing nurses' jobs and nurses doing porter jobs? All the time. Last week, we had to get the healthier patients to push around the bed to the sicker patients. So <laughs> I guess that's kind of using customers to enhance productivity. And India has some interesting stories as well. So we asked India, is this hospital for profit or not for profit? And the hospital manager says, oh, no, this hospital is only for loss making. <laughs> um, and, you know, India can also have some issues of health care as well. You know, do you offer acute care? Yes, ma'am, we do. Do you have an orthopedic department? Yes, ma'am, we do. What about a cardiology department? Yes, ma'am, this is fantastic. You're in our study. You have to have all these three things. You're in our study. Great. Can you connect me with the ortho department? Sorry, ma'am, I'm a patient here. So, <laughs> with that, I will close and thank you very much. Fantastic lecture, <coughs> extremely broad and entertaining. So, uh, what a great, thanks very much, John. So, I think, uh, I don't know, Vitor, did you want to say a few words? Uh, oh, Mario is there. So, Mario, do you want to come and uh, speak for the. But I wanted to ask first I mean, do we have time for questions or not? Do we? I think we have a few. Uh, I think we ha how long do we have? Ten, ten minutes, maybe? Five, ten minutes? So maybe we need ten minutes for, for questions to John. So the floor is open. Yes. Is there a mic? Is there a... Yeah, very good. Thanks. Um, what do you think is the right geographic level at which to do innovation policy? So in the United States, do you think it should be done at the national level, or do you think it's better to do it at the state level? 
That's, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, you could, you know, it's a bit of a cop-out, you could do a mixture of, of both at the federal and the state level. I think realistically, given how dysfunctional things are at the federal level in the U.S., I think these are much more likely to be better if done at a more local level, both at the state level and community level. I think with all of these things, the key issue is setting things up in advance so we can learn from them. So the problem is, you know, you know having advised policymakers have been in the business. People want to have a policy, they put it in, they put no mechanisms in for evaluating it rigorously. So we try and do this ex post, but if we try to set up things ex ante by having some randomization in or using some other way of thinking about a regression discontinuity, that would enable us to kind of figure out which ones of these types of policies are working, uh, are working or not. I, mean, I think it's still the case in many of these policies, like the information policies and advice, we have no idea because there's hardly any, any good, uh, good empirical evidence from these good designs. Everybody wants cocktails. <laughs> no, I see no other question. I think. Uh, oh yes, there is one. Suzanne. John, I would be happy if you could comment on how you would very briefly summarize your recommendations to a university that aims at doing scientific research. How should that be managed and organized? Oh well, great question. So. Um, Carol Proper, one of uh, my, my co-authors, has actually done a study looking at management practices in universities, doing a version of our survey in universities. Um, you know, and you know, she finds um, evidence of, you know, at the department level, huge variation, like we do, uh, a strong correlation between management and, and performance. I think her, her view of what seems to come out of that is that there is some value to um, having um, better ways of tracking people's performance. So we do that a lot in, um, uh, you know, obviously in our kind of publications, but I think we do that maybe less well than some other things that we do in like pre-publication period. So I think having um, better ways of monitoring and tracking what we do, having better mentoring, especially of junior faculty. I think that um, I, I was fortunate enough to be at UCL or I think in, in IFS, but I think there's a great kind of mentoring of senior faculty with junior faculty. I think that's an element which, you know, we, we kind of often lead people to sink or swim. I think having some mentoring would also be a, a very uh, good way of trying to improve things. So kind of better monitoring, better mentoring, and of course, very careful selection of uh, who, you, who you appoint. Yeah, you were mentioning the support uh, for um, promoting good inventors and uh, thinking about um, focusing on the groups that are not doing so well. So we should support um, somehow um, females, the poor, minorities. Uh, I, don't I didn't find your, your argument very convincing. I mean... Uh, Obviously, you could say, um, if some groups are not doing so well, we could support them that, that they do well. But you could equally have the argument and say, well, just fuck them all. Focus, focus on the ones that are doing well. You know? Promote things where you have the largest return. So, uh, aren't, isn't there some research missing indicating why you should um, promote minorities or poor people? Thank you. Well, just let me be clear. I think the, 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 the idea is that um, there are barriers towards entering uh, innovation, say STEM subjects, which may be bigger for some groups than others. So, for example, women, you think about the debates over women entering scientific subjects, the barriers they face, uh, also for minorities, also I think with people from poor backgrounds that operate through the schools they attend, the neighborhoods they live in. Now, if you thought that it's impossible to change those things, then yes, you might say, well, we should think about doing other things. But if you thought that what might be happening, and in the paper we produce evidence for this, is that there may be some very smart people 
who went, who were born in a poor background, who could have grown up to be an Einstein or be someone who's very smart, but were, didn't get that opportunity because they came, went to a bad, poor neighborhood or went to a bad school, then were losing out a lot of productivity by misallocating those individuals away from that. So it's not to say that everybody should be equally supported, but that you want to try and identify some of those individuals who may be missed out by the system. And you know, there, are, there is a lot of good evidence that we do do that. So if you look at the evidence from kind of early interventions, you can actually um, help a lot of kids in poor, poor areas to actually do pretty well. Um, and in our paper, we show that uh, there, does, there does appear to be some evidence that you know, kids from low-income backgrounds could potentially do very well if they were given um, a better chance to enter the innovation sector. So I think, you know, in some ways, there are these potential lost Einsteins out there which could uh, be missing uh, from the current ways that we kind of run our, run our systems of education and other social policies. Maybe we should take uh, three more questions and then stop, I guess. Yeah. So we are, uh, yes, one here, one here, and one, I thought. Yeah, so you can stop. Yeah, maybe it's, yeah, that's right. We have three there. I could. Hi. I was wondering if you thought that there was a case for government policies and interventions to spread good management styles around. Um, just as we do with uh, R&D and trying to create incentives for those sorts of, uh, for firms to do more of that as well. Maybe we could group the questions. Why don't we have group them to go faster? You had, yeah, and then there is another one. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to get your comments kind of connecting the early ideas about creative destruction where firms do lots of different things and those who come up with the best strategies kind of succeed and grow versus the ideas of trying to get large groups of firms to follow the same uh, well, uh, basically well-documented management practices. So that difference between letting people experiment and finding the best strategies versus encouraging people to follow a consistent style of management. Yes, and a third one, uh, there was a third question, uh, I think. Yes, 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 right there, yeah. Uh, in 2009, um, we asked in a seminar, Philippe Aguillon, um, what does he think, um, what would be the best place to invest more in education? And um, in, a, in, a, in a sense, what would be the best for economic growth and incre increasing uh, productivity? Uh, so that was in 2009, and he said there is a straightforward uh, answer in high and high middle income economies, let's spend more on higher education. Do you think there is such a straightforward answer to this question now? Is it higher investment in higher education? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so very quickly. Um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of management policy, so I, I think in terms of thinking about policies, it's kind of structural policies, especially around competition, openness to trade, and globalization. But I think there is, a, there is a potential role on information intervention. So most countries operate some type of advisory services and um, ways of spreading information around, just as we do for kind of uh, technology. And I think, you know, I think, the, the, I think potentially those are quite important. I think the problem is we have very few evaluations of those, and it's very hard to know whether or not they're successful, what things we could do. So one of the things I'm trying to do in, you know, in, in different parts of the world and different sectors is try to set up more randomized controlled trials of these type of policies to see, to see what works. I do think that's uh, potentially a big win. I mean, certainly um, that uh, there's some suggestive evidence to say the work that uh, Nick did in India, that that's the case. On the second question on reallocation, uh, I, you know, I, I do think that um, it, the, the reallocation aspect is very important. So one of the things I didn't mention was if you, if you look at these cross-country differences I mentioned about you know, a third of those productivity differences with the US could be accounted for by management. Of, of the amount which could be accounted for by management, 
A lot of that difference, uh, again, about a third of that, uh, of that thing you can explain, is to do with better reallocation in the following sense. That in countries like the US, the firms which have better management practices tend to be much larger. The economy tends to allocate more output towards those type of firms than is the case, say, in southern European countries, where even if you're relatively well managed, you can't seem to attract a big market share. So that suggests, consistent with a lot of other results, that you know, policies which enable successful firms, well-managed firms, to grow more easily are policies which could actually help productivity. So you know, policies which inhibit the growth of firms because, you know, as you know, I have this recent paper on France, which is you know, when you get to be 50 employees, you get a whole tsunami of labor market regulation, and that can slow down growth. That potentially you might want to, re you might want to think about should you have so many policies which maybe penalize growth. So I think there's a whole set of issues around reallocation there which are, are, are very important. On, on higher education, um, I mean, I, I think that uh, I do believe in the importance of higher education. I have other work which suggests that you know, universities are engines of innovation, engines of growth. Um, I, you know, I, 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 in terms of its in relation with management, I think there's, there's, there's a two-pronged answer to that. And one is that general human capital from education is beneficial, I think, towards improving management practices. But I do think that it's also the case that more targeted type of managerial education could work. You know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not making a, a plea that everybody should do an MBA, but I do think that uh, you know, there's a plausible case that uh, some type of managerial education, training courses, can actually be beneficial, uh, especially you know, maybe for some, this is an area where maybe small and medium-sized firms could benefit from this. So I do think there may be, there is a role for that. Again, I think it's a, this is an area which requires a lot more study and a lot more evaluation work, but I do think there's an aspect towards managerial education which could be important in raising productivity. John, thank you very much. It was a tour de force. And uh, in fact, you know, when I teach uh, growth economics, I said, you know, I chose to be Trupeterian because, uh, you know, the, the, young peop the young generation, the younger than me, will do better than me, there will be my creative destruction. So the day they do better than me, it proves the theory right, you see. So that's, uh, that's the, uh, you gave an illustration of, uh, of uh, you know, all what has happened, you know, the, the huge amplification you gave to this with, uh, with this data and, uh, and how we look at productivity and innovation in a completely different way than we did uh, 20 years ago. So it's a fantastic lecture. Thank you so much, John. We should applaud. So I will, uh, to finish, uh, to, before we go to the, the cocktail, uh, the welcome, uh, I will give the floor to Mario. In fact, uh, Mario, we first contacted you because you were heading the local organizing committee, but in the meantime, you became finance minister of Portugal. Quoi. So, uh, but you will talk as, a, as organizer, as local organizer, not as finance minister? Or as a Yes. People will start asking many questions. Yeah. yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, John. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, I will talk as a chair of the local organizing committee. Uh, I like, it's going to be very brief. Uh, if uh, instead I was going to speak as a finance minister, it will, it will be certainly longer. But uh, just, just to, to be focused, <laughs> uh, we uh, would like uh,
I will I will restart, and, uh, and sorry for for this change in scenario. A little bit unexpected, but uh, th this is the right table, so we are all now prepared. And I was precisely going to to thank uh, the uh, European Economic Association and even the Economic Econometric Society to bring these great meetings to to Lisbon. Uh, it's obviously a pleasure to welcome you all here. Um, Lisbon is a great city, you will have a week-long uh, experience here uh, and I hope it will be a quite productive and interesting one, both uh, inside uh, the rooms and, and outside. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure uh, for us to organize this conference. Uh, the guys who did the hard work uh, are uh, Francisco, Luis, Alessandra and Vitor, uh, as uh, Philippe already mentioned, uh, I was uh, kidnapped for different uh, functions uh, in the process of preparing these meetings, but uh, I'm sure everything will be okay. Uh, if not, please complain to me, not to them, because I am used to receive complaints from many, many people, uh, which I will take gladly from you as well, although I don't expect them. Uh, Portugal is um, a great country. Uh, we are uh, experience, experiencing a, a period uh, of uh, both economically and socially uh, quite productive one. Uh, I hope we can share this with you. Uh, it's, it's really uh, been uh, quite an interesting uh, event also to study uh, the economics uh, of uh, reforms, so please uh, tell us uh, what you think uh, of, of the path we, we've been uh, uh, taking uh, lately. There is going to be a welcome recession after this session, uh, which uh, of course you are all invited, uh, and I, will, I hope you can join us. Uh, it's going to be in ISCTE, IUL, the building uh, next to this one, uh, and again, thank you very much for coming. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm representing here the rector of Ishkte, where you, uh, I think, did the registration this morning, and where we will all go uh, after this session. And I want to welcome you all to, uh, to Lisbon. Uh, of course, uh, the societies that have uh, chosen Lisbon to, for this meeting, the local organizing committee, sorry for being a little bit local, Alexandre, Luis, Francisco, Vitor, and last but not least, of course, uh, our Minister Mario uh, Centeno, as in uh, uh, economics probably, I'm not an expert, but in academia we also have these fortunate accidents and virtuous accidents. So you start organizing a conference and then when it happens, uh, you have the minister here. So uh, it's something that we should all profit. Uh, I just wish you a very nice week uh, in this conference. Uh, I would like you to bring home uh, inspiring ideas, not only uh, from inside the walls of the conference, but also from Lisbon and from Portugal and from the economy of Portugal and the society of Portugal and the Portuguese-speaking countries, I hope, uh, as uh, when we have these large conferences, and this one is especially uh, large, that a lot of people take a little bit of Lisbon and Portugal in the back of their minds, both for the research topics and for the inspiration they, uh, they can uh, have in their professional and, uh, and personal uh, life. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we try to balance the climate uh, as good as possible, I think. The local organizing committee is a little bit hotter than, than we expected, but uh, it's probably because there are so many economists uh, together uh, here in Lisbon. Uh, so but that's not for me to explain. Thank you very much on behalf of the rector of, uh, of ISCTE, and I wish you a very, very pleasant and uh, 
uh, interesting week. And I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague of the University of Lisbon. Thank you very much. Well, just a brief word of welcome on behalf of the Rector of the University of Lisbon. I do hope you enjoyed our musical chess number just about five minutes ago. I'd like to congratulate all of you and, of course, the organizing committee, uh, headed by no less than the Minister, Minister of Finance of the country, which I think is a big accolade to the conference. I just hope and wish that you also enjoyed the city and the country. I recently read in an article, in the Financial Times article, the columnists say, in a very curious take on the country, that Portugal has arguably the finest weather in the world. Well, arguably should be underlined because it's too hot at the moment. But in any case, it has arguably the finest weather in the world. And he added, and it's also the most boring place on earth. And when I read this, I decided to write a letter to the editor. I think it's the second letter to the editor I've ever written, saying that if that is the case, surely it sounds like paradise. Thank you. I think we are we deserve the uh, welcome. welcome. Exactly. So back to uh, back to drinking. Thanks. Back to drinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right.